Uh, good morning and welcome to this next comp seminar series. Uh, um, welcome to those of you who are online, particularly uh, we were meant to be in person, but unfortunately Oriel uh, caught COVID, so we're now fully online, so you can all enjoy his talk there. Um, for those who don't know, next comp is a UK program grant exploring the next generation of composites for compression and we're very interested in material development and in particular how we might characterize materials on the on the micro scale and link that to macro scale uh, responses of composite materials so we're very pleased to have today's talk from Ariel uh, Gavada Diez uh, who is a new lecturer here at Imperial College uh, and previously worked at University of Nottingham and gained his PhD there at the UTC uh, with Rolls-Royce and we are very interested to hear what he has to say so uh, it'll be over to you Ariel we'll uh, take some questions at the end thanks very much thanks a lot Milo um I hope everyone can can see me and hear me well my name is Oriel. Thanks, Milo, for the introduction. And I'm going to be showing you a bit the work we have been doing in micro and nanomechanical testing of ceramics and composites. I'm really sorry I cannot be there in person. I was really looking to be there. I was really looking forward to be there in person. But hopefully I can deliver the presentation also in a nice way and I can give the nice message I wanted Please to give. So. Can you hear me? OK. Right. So, um, just bear in mind that in this presentation, I'm going to have a lot of work on ceramic matrix composites, which is not exactly the same as a polymer composite, but uh, I'm going to have the, the, the relevant introduction to make sure everyone is on, on the same page, knowing that Nexcom is really focused on, on polymer matrix composites, if I understand correctly. Yes, all good. Thanks very much, Ara. OK. Right, so um, I, I just wanted to, to, to give a, a a quick introduction in structural ceramics. So ceramics are very interesting material for extreme environment applications. And that's when we think about high temperature, corrosion resistance, wear resistance. And ceramics are also interesting because they have a high strength. The problem of ceramics is that they are intrinsically brittle, right? But luckily for us, there, there has been the ceramic community that has developed new ways of how we can process and manufacture uh, ceramic components which are a bit more ductile or at least less brittle. And we can start like competing with some materials such as metals and like get all, all this like retaining big part of the strength, but also increase the toughness in here. And there are multiple ways of doing that. I'm not showing here all of them, but this is some of the more relevant ones. We can, we can have ceramic matrix composites, we can have nano laminates such as max faces, or we can have zirconia based materials, which are, which are used for like thermal barrier coating or bio, bio, bio bio application type stuff. But these materials, they have all something in common and is that we need, we really need to customize the micro and nano structure so we can actually get this toughness up. And specifically in the case of ceramic matrix composites, which I'm going to focus quite a bit of my talk today, we really need those interfaces in place, which these interfaces or interlayers, they are normally like less than a micron in thickness. And they basically represent a very small volume of the material, but at the same time, they're so important to actually get our material up here and be able to use them as a structural component. But then what I'm really interested in is how we can actually characterize and measure those properties, knowing that every time more, we're basically developing microstructures which are more fine, there is more things going on in there, and they are more tricky to actually understand what's going on. Just wanted to give you a quick of an introduction of ceramic matrix composites, CMCs, especially in the context of our engines. And the reason for that is because I think there is a very nice similarity of what happened with the polymer matrix composite industry when we think about all this new fuselage changing from aluminum alloys to actually polymer or carbon fiber reinforced polymers. I think there is something similar going on at the moment with ceramic matrix composites. So if you actually pay attention at this center plot in here, what we can see is what happened over the last 50 years. And basically the objective of our engine industry is basically how we can increase the temperature that we can run our, our engine, but also decrease the weight of the components, right? So people have been looking at how we can actually change the manufacturing or the processing of nickel alloys. So actually by having uh, directionally solidified components or single crystals, and that allows us to increase the temperature that we can run our, our engine. But then we, we, we also started realizing that we probably need to put some ceramics on there. And th these all started with thermal barrier coating, which are 
mainly based on, on zirconia-based materials, and that allowed to actually run the ARA engine at higher temperatures. There are also other ways that people have been exploring all this running together, which is basically having uh, internal cooling, and that allows to like actively cool our component. And in some cases, we might be even running our ARA engine at higher temperatures than the actual melting point of the metal. But something that happened more recently, because you, you can see that all this happened over the last 30, 50 years, but over the last five, 10 years, ceramic matrix composites appear as a strong candidate for the ARA engine industry, and actually CMCs are already flying over the last five years, which allow to actually make this step change in here, and we can already just with the CMC fly at, at, at a lot higher temperature. This is just an, an, an example of what happens in the ARA engine industry, but again, this could be applied to the aerospace industry. That could also be applied to, to energy generation, such as fusion or brakes in cars. Yeah? So there, there, there are multiple applications where extreme environments are a potential candidate to replace metals with ceramic composites. That's the largest scale that you are going to see in this test. So if you look at the scale bar in here, that's a, a a millimeter uh, scale bar and what you're going to see is a single edge notch beam test where we have a notch in here and we apply a three point bending test and we can see at some point how cracks will start forming in that you can see all these cracks starting to deflect all this direction that by the way is, is, a, is a carbon silicon carbide composite so carbon fibers embedded in a silicon carbide matrix and what we can see is how the fracture mechanism starts becoming quite complex yeah we have we have removed the intrinsic brittleness of ceramic matrix composites, and now we have a complex fracture mechanism which induces this high toughness that ceramic matrix composites have. But as you can see here, in, in this particular area, we are going to have many fibers, we're going to have many interfaces, many matrix regions. So the actual failure mechanism, even if we do a test inside an SEM or, in, uh, or under an optical microscope at these length scales, there is much information that we don't really see, and that's challenging when we try to design new materials or actually model what, what, what is going on in there. And that's why our philosophy is to basically, we need to understand the different length scales at where things are happening, so we are able to like monitor and design new materials and fit all these, all these, all these modeling strategies for these composites. This slide, I just took it from, from, from from the polymer matrix uh, research uh, side of things, and something very similar is going on, obviously. And the idea behind that is if, if we actually want to model a component, we really need to understand what happens at the micro scale. And my approach is even that we probably even need to go at the nanoscale, but at, at this stage, that that's probably already good, that we need to understand what happens at the micron scale, understand how the fiber, how the interface, how the matrix behave, so we can actually fit all these computational mechanics and we can actually design and uh, model co components at the larger scale. Right, I'm, I'm going to start focusing a bit more on ceramic matrix composites and the point I want to make is that if we actually want to make the ceramic matrix composites to be placed somewhere in here, we really need to design those interfaces correctly. And that's what these stress strain curves in here show. And that's some literature data that was done uh, 30 years ago, but I think it represents quite well the, the message I want to give, which is if we have a silicon carbide, silicon carbide, which is the main CMC used in our engine applications, we are going to see that if we have a CMC with no interface, which is this red line in here, the material behaves very brittly and with a very low strength, right? So that, that, that's not interesting for, for our case. But as soon as we start depositing interfaces or interlayers and we can combine having weakened, strong or multi-layer and single layer, we can start customizing our stress strain curve and change our proportional limit, our work of fracture, or even our ultimate tensile strength. So this, this is interesting because we're basically saying that depositing those interfaces and having the right microstructure on those interfaces is what is going to, is going to allow us to get the right uh, stress strain curve that we need for structural applications. And you're probably all familiarized with this with this fracture surface, but basically in CMC we get something called the fiber pullout mechanism, which is basically a way to, to, to absorb energy during fracture. So what you are seeing here is not really plasticity, but it's a kind of pseudodactyl, a graceful failure type mechanism, which comes from all these fibers pulling out from the surface and having all this friction and things going on in there. 
So basically, when, when, when we start thinking about micromechanics, we see that interfaces and fibers are going to be really important. And all these, all, all these, all these uh, components or constituents in our material, they're all going to be a few microns or nanometer size. So basically, we need to start developing all this micro and nanomechanical testing that allows us to characterize all these, all these um, uh, constituents. This is a very simplified uh, scenario of how uh, failure happens in CMC. I, ho I hope if there is people in the audience uh, that uh, focus on modeling, don't get too upset with me. But I think that represents quite well what happens in a CMC, which basically we say that cracks will form in the matrix. And at some point, these cracks, hopefully they are going to deflect along, uh, along our interfaces. And basically this deflection mechanism will be very based on the uh, on, on the fracture toughness of the fibers, which is uh, marked here as GFC, and the interfacial fracture toughness, which is the fracture toughness of the interface. Okay. Is this ratio here, which is going to tell us if crack deflection is going to happen or not? And this is very important for having all this pullout mechanism going on. We also know that the fibers are going to fail in mode one, because they are basically in tension. But we know that the interface is going to fail in a combined mode mixity of fracture, and that's because cracks are going to deflect, but we are going to have a stiffness mismatch in here, which basically is going to activate mode one and mode two at the same time. We also know that the friction of our interface, so what's going on in here after this crack has propagated, is going to be very dominated, or is, is, is going to dominate what happens during pullout, or how much energy we are storing during pullout. And we also know that the strength of fibers is going to is going to give us an idea of how strong our composite is going to be. So in summary, we have all these micromechanical properties that we would like to have a systematic way that we can characterize so we can scan between different materials or we can design new materials or understand how they will perform uh, in service. So this is the material you're going to see big part of the data. That's the silicon carbide, silicon carbide CMC. So silicon carbide fibers embedded in a silicon carbide matrix. And we deposit what is called a boron nitride interface in here. Normally the industry now is using two main interfaces. That's normally boron nitride or carbon, pyrolytic carbon. So aerospace industry, especially our engines, are focusing more on boron nitrate because of the oxidation resistance and nuclear type energy generation focusing more on carbon. But I'm going to expand a bit more later on how these interfaces might actually be a limiting factor for these materials. What you're seeing here in A is an SEM image of the silicon carbide fibers, and you have a silicon carbide matrix around it, which is deposited by CBI, which stands by chemical vapor infiltration. So we basically have a chamber with gases, and we grow this matrix around it. And we have also an interface, which is uh, also deposited by chemical vapor infiltration, and that's this boron nitride. So that gives us the silicon carbide, boron nitride, silicon carbide CMC. What you see at the bottom of the screen is some TM, so transmission electron microscopy, of when we extract a slice of something going on at this interfacial region. So what we see is a slice of fiber, interface, and the CVI silicon carbide matrix. Right? Something I want you to pay attention is, even if we have silicon carbide, silicon carbide CMC, you can see that the microstructure of the fiber and the microstructure of the matrix is totally different, right? So even if we have silicon carbide, silicon carbide, these materials have different strength, different stiffnesses and different elastic properties. Also, what we can see is that we have an interface in here, which is normally around between 100 to 300 nanometers in thickness. And we can also see that with these techniques, we can actually get data of the crystallography of these interfaces, but also what's the defects that we have in them. And we will correlate this to understand how failure happens during composite failure. Right, let's just focus a bit more on the actual testing, which is hopefully for what people came today. So I'm going to show a lot of SEM in situ micromechanical testing, but first I wanted to give you an introduction of how we actually prepare our samples. So we use something called uh, plasma FIP or gallium FIP, and FIP stands for focus ion beam. So what, what we are doing is bombarding gallium ions in the case of gallium, gallium FIP. Uh, we, are, we are bombarding uh, ions to our sample, and that's a way to nanofabricate samples. Once we have these samples nanofabricated, we can put them 
inside an SEM in situ nano in dente, which goes inside our SEM or high resolution SEM, and we can perform our testing. You have some images here of how we use this uh, FIP to actually manufacture our samples. You can see here that's a region of a toe of fibers where we have multiple fibers and we have different regions where we've gone and we have removed material with the gallium FIP and we have left in the center something that is what we actually want to test. Bear in mind, this is just an example. Any shape you can imagine or anything you want to nanofabricate, you could probably do it with FIP. And the idea here is that then when we have these samples ready, we can come with our indenters and we can do a variety of testing depending on the indenter that, that you use. I'm going to come back to this test later, but this is just an example of how we use FIB to prepare our samples. Right, so the first test I wanted to show you is what we call the push-out test, which is more common in, in, in the literature of composites. And how this test works is we have a relatively thin sample in here. We're talking about 150, give it or take, microns. And what we are going to do is going to come with a flat punch and we are going to push fibers outside. Yeah, So we're going to make sure that our fibers don't have anything underneath and we're just going to come and push these fibers out. I'm going to play the video, so if people are getting bored, now is the moment to switch on again. So this is the video of a fiber push out. So we have an accommodation region in here. Now we're starting to actually load our fiber and we're going to have all this failure mechanism and you have this stick and slip behavior. So normally what we do is we use this maximum load in here to measure what we call the interfascial shear strength. And then we can use this area in here to measure our friction between the fiber and the interface or the fiber and the matrix, sorry. And this is interesting because this only happens when you have a true displacement control system. But by having that, we are able to discriminate between the first, the bonding, what we call the strength, and then the actual friction that happens in between the fiber and the matrix. Right, the second test I wanted to show you, that's also going to be a video, so pay attention soon. Well, what I'm going to show you here something is, is, is a test that we developed with Oxford. And the idea of here is that when we have a test similar to this, we don't really see what happens at the interface. Yeah, we are pushing our fiber inside and we don't really see how this interface is failing. So something we wanted to develop was a test where we could actually see what happens around these fibers and what induces failure during the push out. So these samples are prepared with focus ion beam, as, as, I, as I explained before. So we remove material around it, and in here we leave half a fiber. And now I'm going to play the video. Hopefully the videos are playing well online. And you can see how we can push this half a fiber, and we can start seeing what happens at the interface. It's true that some people will start thinking, well, if you actually remove half a fiber, you might be changing the stress state of the fiber. That, that, that's probably true. I mean, I, I can say that in these materials, the residual stress of the fiber is, is, is very low, but that, that's, that's obviously a, a limitation of this test. But the interesting thing of here is that by doing this kind of test, we can start thinking of or start observing how failure happens, right? And something that is quite interesting that we started observing is that how we form all these radial cracks that will start interconnecting fibers and will start damaging the interfaces of neighboring fibers. And this kind of gives us an explanation of when we measure interfacial properties between um, adjacent or like close pack fibers, we start seeing a change in properties and that's because we have this stochasticity that comes from actually like starting to damage, starting to damage neighboring fibers during the push out of a single fiber. The other test I wanted to show you is something that we call the loading and loading push out or push in. And before I play the video, and that's a very nice video to, to, to actually see, but first I just wanted to introduce you a bit to this schematic. So what you see here is a schematic of a fiber and a matrix. Yeah, and what you're going to see here is how we are going to push the fiber in. And before it actually pushes out, we are going to see how by doing loading and loading, we can control this U displacement. And this U displacement, which basically translate of how much I'm pushing my fiber in, yeah, so this U is how much I'm pushing this fiber in, there is some ways of relating this U value to the actual crack length, which is, which is, uh, which is um, term A in, in, in this, this plot, and crack length will be these this red lines in here. 
And this is very interesting because as soon as we start thinking about fracture mechanics and measuring interfascial fracture toughness, we need some kind of values of crack length. That's what will help us get some values of fracture toughness, right? I'm going to play the video now on the right hand side and you're going to see how we do some loading and loading and when we do unloading we recover this displacement back in here but is this displacement u so how much this fiber has got in which allows us to get some predictions of what is the crack length and that's what allows us to get the fracture toughness in mode two yeah, because remember mode two fracture toughness will be something that happens in shear Something also quite interesting that goes more on the data analysis side of things is that if I show you what's the low displacement curve that we get from our uh, load and displacement sensors, it will be something like this. And you could see that the displacement that we get will be something like four and five microns. But this is not really this U value I was talking about here. And the reason for that is because this material is quite stiff and we need to reach very high loads for this stage that goes inside an SCM. So basically telling us that this is not really the U values that we are looking for. But now I'm going to play this video again, and I want you to pay attention to these squares that are not very visible. I'm sorry about that, but you can see hopefully two squares in here. What we are doing here is we are tracking the tip versus the sample. And by having these tracking algorithms going on at the same time, we can actually plot the low displacement curve, which is corrected, yeah, where we don't have any compliance coming from our setup or our sample. And now is that these values of displacement, they now correlate to the value of U that we were looking for, and this is what allows us to calculate the fracture toughness in mode two. Right, this is, I'm going back to this uh, image in here that you've seen before. This is what we call the micro double cantilever beam test. And the idea of here is that again, with the FIP, we can remove material, we can go at different interfaces, wherever we want, and we can leave at the center of our, of our uh, region what we want to test. The idea here is that we wanted to make this test so, so, so small that actually, even if our fibers are intrinsically round, when we have this this double cantilever beam test, our interface is almost straight. You can see the front and the back that the interface is almost going straight. And what we are doing is having a test. For people that don't know, double cantilever beam test is when we open two arms and we propagate a crack in between in mode one. And what we do is we're going to propagate this crack within this interface in here. And we are going to measure what is the interfacial toughness of a single interface in mode one. So, um, what I'm going to show you now is the video of how we do that, but first of all, just say that this is this simplifies quite a bit the analysis because that's a very simplified structure where there is some analytical model uh, modeling behind that. But if you have a look at the video, what we do is we apply a wedge and we propagate the crack within the interface. So we are measuring what is the toughness of a single interface at the same time. Yeah? And something quite interesting in here that uh, was also developed uh, within the group was that um, we don't use any information from the load or the, or the displacement sensors. What we use is using these D values, which is how much the arms open, and these A values, which is how much this crack propagates. We use image tracking algorithms to actually measure that. This allows us to like not have problems with frictions between the wedge and the sample, and that simplifies a bit the analysis. We were also doing some work with Bristol, and that's the team of uh, Stephen Hallett and Giuliano Allegri and Ricardo Mano at the time, the student. And the idea that we wanted to know is if actually having some samples which are not perfect has an influence, right? And here, what we were looking at is what is the effect of the tapering and what is the effect of having an interface that has a different stiffness and basically what we do as i said before from our images we measure what is the opening of the arms we get this experimentally and we fed that to the finite element model uh, which was developed by bristol and basically for different values of fracture toughness we plot what will be the crack length or the simulated crack length. Here in black, you can see the experimental crack length, and you can see that for these values of fracture toughness, we kind of get a good agreement and we are probably closer to like around 1.8 or like 1.5 joules per meter square as an interfacial toughness measurement. 
this this is interesting because by using the analytical equation in this case we get very similar values so that's more or less the plots that we uh, use for our experiment where we plot the critical energy release rate or the interfacial fracture toughness same things in joules per meter square over crack length and we basically discard what happens in here because here we have more error due to the measurement of the crack length if you remember to the equation before the crack length goes to the power of four so for shorter crack length we have bigger errors so we normally tend to work at this part of the of the graph so we propagate cracks for longer so to have less error and we end up having an average of like two plus minus one joules per meter square which is quite similar to what we were getting uh, using finite element modeling in average Right, the advantage of that is that because we propagate such a controlled crack and we know exactly where that crack is, we can go to transmission electron microscope, we can take some samples out and we can see exactly where that crack propagated. In this case, we can see that the crack propagated between the fiber and the BN interlayer in there. You can also see in there. And probably that maybe there is some crack healing going on, but this is maybe more, more of a less uh, clear claim to make. But this is something that is quite relevant for the compo uh, ceramic composite um, aspect side of things. And it's because we normally distinguish between three different debonding or failure mechanisms of interfaces. We can have outside the bonding, which is when the crack goes between the, the matrix and the interface. We can have inside the bonding when the crack goes between the fiber and the interface, or we can have cohesive failure when the crack goes within the interface itself. In our case, we are observing this one here, which is inside the bonding. So look at the crack, how it propagates between the fiber and the boronitrate interface. And this is probably the less suitable case. The reason for that is because the fibers are going to be our load carriers at the, at the, at the end of the, of the stress strain curve. So if we actually have this cracking mechanism, what this means is that the oxygen or the environment gets inside our samples and start attacking these fibers. This is a problem because the creep or the time dependent uh, failure of these materials goes down if we have inside the bonding. So the idea is that we can use this test also as a way of understanding how different interfaces might change from different types of the bonding mechanisms of interfaces, which is proven to depend or like affect better um, the failure of the composite when you have complex environment and then time dependency. Right. If I go back to this slide, I've been, I've been starting to say, well, we actually care about all these micromechanical properties, and I have shown you how the interfacial properties, we, we, we can actually uh, measure and quantify the interfacial fracture toughness, and I've shown you how to do that with mode one and mode two with the DCB and the push out test. I've also shown you how we can measure the friction of the interface, and this is done again with the push out test. But still, we, we, we care of what's the properties of the fibers in terms of toughness, because that will explain us or tell us if crack is going to deflect or not. But it's also important that we characterize what is the strength of the fiber, so we actually relate a bit of what's the ultimate tensile strength of the composite. So the first test I'm going to show you concerning fibers is the fiber bending test. So this is a silicon wafer, and what we do is we mill material away and we put fibers which are well aligned. I'm not going to explain how we do that. That, 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 that will be a, a long explanation. But basically, we can align fibers to these trenches. And what we can do is then we can do a three-point bending test. So I'm playing the video on the right-hand side where we do a very simplified three-point bending test, but on a single fiber. You can see how the edges were lifting. And surprise, surprise, silicon carbide fiber by itself is very brittle. Not the composite doesn't behave in a brittle way, but if you test the interfaces or the fibers by themselves, they behave in a very brittle manner. So that's how we actually measure what's the strength of single fibers. But as I said before, we also care about the toughness of fibers. So in here, what we do is a very similar test to what I've shown you before, the double cantilever beam test. But now we don't have an interface in the middle. We are just splitting the fiber itself. And as I said before, we use the values at longer crack length and we get values of fracture toughness of fibers, of silicon carbide fibers of around six plus minus two joules per meter square. Right, so we, we, we kind of end up in a situation where I've shown you how we can measure a variety of micromechanical properties for the fibers, for the interfaces. And this is very helpful because help us 
developing some models, and it also help us design and understand the failure of composites. So the next part of my presentation is going to be case studies of how we have used all these techniques to help the development or understanding the failure of ceramic matrix composite. So I'm going to have three examples I'm going to show you today, which we, we have done for different industries. The first one is uh, some project that we were doing a couple of two, two or three years ago with Rolls Royce, and we were looking at what's the environmental degradation of these composites. And something that we realized is that this is macro mechanical testing that Rolls Royce was doing, so tensile testing of big samples, classic tensile testing. And we could see that when we test the samples as received, the stress strain curve was something like that, very pseudodactyl, something very nice that basically shows this graceful failure of the CMC. When we put the CMC at 800 degrees for 500 hours, the stress strain curve here in green remains very similar, meaning that the composite keeps quite well the performance after putting it at high temperature or intermediate temperatures in this context for quite a long time. The problem came when we put our samples with water exposures, and that's 500 hours, 95% relative humidity at 65 degrees C. And I just wanted to I just want to put this a bit in context, but this basically for an air engine could symbolize being uh, stopped at Singapore airport in a very hot day, for example, 95% relative humidity, 65 degrees. You can see that the stress strain curve of our material changed dramatically. Yeah, our proportional limit goes down, our work of work of fracture goes down, our strength goes down, and more importantly, when we go back to the same temperature that we have before and we just left the material for 15 minutes, the material here in yellow or orangey color, the material behaves totally brittle. So that's basically an example of how environmental degradation, depending on the steps that you follow and what is the degradation step that you test, might actually change the performance of the composite. But this is quite interesting to observe that uh, there is multiple things going on in here, and by looking just at the stress strain curve, we are not able to predict if the interfaces are not behaving well or the fibers or the matrix and stuff. So here from now on, I'm going to show you how we use micro mechanics to explain what happened here. As I showed you before, I presented the push out test where we push fibers out and we can measure the interfascial shear strength and we can also measure the friction. If you remember that low, uh, low displacement curve I showed you before. And what was quite interesting to observe is that the interfacial properties between as received and heating didn't really change too much. Yeah? So the average and the standard deviation are quite close. So that, that explains why the stress strain curve is not changing too much. The, the, the interfaces st stay quite similar. But as soon as we expose them to water, we can see how these interfacial properties decrease them dramatically. Basically means that these interfaces are too weak now. They don't have any resistance. They don't give any friction to our material. So basically the material is failing very early. And when we look at the reheating, the interfacial properties don't change too much. So basically this explains what happens in here. We can see that from the black or the green line compared to the blue one, what's happening is that the interfacial properties have changed and then all our low displacement curve has changed. But if I go back in here, the reheating doesn't change the interfacial properties. So we still don't know why this curve, this blue curve changes to this orange curve if the interfacial properties are the same. So this is what we do with fiber bending tests. So we were doing single fiber bending test and we were comparing as a receive water exposures and reheat. And what we can see is that after reheating, it seems that the average of uh, fiber strength goes down. And that will explain why we also see a change in the in the stress strain curve, not on the water exposure step, but on the reheating step. So basically, in summary, what we are seeing is that when we do a first step of heating, our interface stays the same. That's a, a transmission electron microscope TM image of our interface. The interface doesn't change too much. When we have this second step, which is water exposures, we can see how our interface gets degraded and it's basically that this boron nitrate is reacting with the water and creates this like uh, this acid coming out of the sample. And that means that our interfacial shear strength goes down but the properties of the fibers stay the same. When we have this step in here, which is the reheat, 
the interfacial properties stay the same because they are already very degraded. But now there is space for the oxygen to come in and start degrading our fibers, and that's why our st the strength of our fibers goes up. Right. So hopefully now you see how we can use micromechanics and nanoscale characterization to understand how complex environmental degradation stuff might be building up and how each component might be degraded. The other example I wanted to show you of how we use uh, micromechanical testing is how th the work that we are doing to find new interfaces. As I said before, we have silicon carbide fibers in a silicon carbide matrix. That's the main common CMC material. And the main interfaces that people are using are boron nitrate and pyrolytic carbon, as I said before. But there are some challenges in here, and especially when we think about sustainable aviation. We know that if we start using hydrogen fuels, we're going to have as exhaust product water. And I just show you how boron nitrate is really bad with water or doesn't really like water that much. So potentially that tells us that the current interface might not work when we switch to like a more green uh, fuel like such as hydrogen. But there is also the demand of having CMCs for fusion, and that will be more as a breather blanket component. And we also know that both of those interfaces, boron nitrate and pyrolytic carbon, doesn't seem to behave very well on this fusion type of environments. And that's because of the neutron interaction and how they react with this neutron and how they swell and stuff. So basically, there is the need of finding new interfaces. But the problem is there is no clear way of what interface is going to work or not. And when you think about designing new interfaces, you could be switching between chemistries, you could be switching between thicknesses, you can be switching between microstructures, so that there are many parameters that we could be changing and we don't really know what's the best way. So this is a project that we were doing with ATL, which is a company quite close to, to, to London, and they, they specialize on depositing interfaces or materials or ceramics uh, with, with, with chemical vapor deposition. And we were exploring what's the potential of using oxides interfaces. So we still have a silicon carbide fiber in a silicon carbide matrix, but now we switch to have some oxide interfaces. The idea of that is that because they are oxides, they should be more resistant to like all these oxidation oxidation environments, especially when we think about this aerospace context. So what you can see here is how we look at ytterbium silicates as oxides, and we can see how we have we can deposit thicker interface or thinner interfaces, and we can also have yttria silicates where we can have again thick interfaces or thin interfaces as an example of what I'm going to show you now. So the idea is that by using micromechanics, we can manufacture a very small amount of material and we can test a wide range of interfaces and understand which one might be better. And that's what you are going to see in these plots in here. So we do again our push in, push out test so we can measure toughness of the interface and we can measure the friction of the interface. And here how these plots work is the color is different chemistries. <coughs> Sorry, and the, and the x-axis is the thickness of the interface. So that's the two parameters we were exploring. What we can see is that the toughness doesn't really affect that much. Sorry, the, the chemistry or the thickness doesn't really change that much the toughness of the interface, but it seems that the friction is really influenced by the thickness of our interface, meaning that the thicker our interface, the lower our friction. <laughs> Sorry. What we know based on modeling and literature is that we want to be within these green areas. That's normally how CMCs have been working, and that's the micromechanical properties that we have been using so far in our current CMCs. So that basically tell us that probably thicker interfaces will give us a better behavior. And what you can see in this slide is when we actually test big, comp big composites, big, big CMCs, when we have thin interfaces, we have a very flat fracture surface, but as soon as we have start having thicker interfaces, we start having all these pull out mechanisms, which indicates that we are going to have a bigger and uh, 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 an, an enhanced toughness of our CMC. And this is what I showed you before, how we require this pull out mechanism and thick interfaces seem to be giving that direction. We probably still not there yet, but this is probably telling us the direction that we need to go.
Right, the last, the last example I wanted to show you on CMCs is the work we are doing with UKAA. And the idea is that uh, uh, Fusion uh, is very interested in, in, use, in using CMCs, as I said before. The problem is we're currently looking for new interfaces, and the problem is uh, doing all these irradiation damage campaigns that, that, that the Fusion industry needs take very long time. Right? And even if you wanted to test only a hundred or three hundred micrometer side sample. That will be a very long irradiation damage campaign. So the idea was, can we actually miniaturize this even smaller and just test the interface at such a smaller length scale? And this is what we are doing here. We are basically with the FIP, we are removing material and we are ending up with a sample, which that's the thickness of the sample. And I don't know if you can see, but that's the fiber seen from the bottom in there. So with the focus ion beam, we remove the material and we leave a single fiber that now we are going to test a smaller length scale so we can accelerate all these irradiation campaigns and we can find interfaces faster. And that's what this video on the left hand side is going to show you. You're going to see a push out test, the fiber coming at the bottom in there, and we can measure the interfacial properties. But this is a bit more complex than that, and that's because and that, that's some work that Alex Leder was doing at UKAA, so that, that, that's his, his data in here. But he was putting all together all this data because obviously the smaller that we go, the more likely we start getting higher, uh, higher properties because the smaller, the stronger type tendency. But what, what we started finding is that if we actually go bigger than five microns, we start getting data which is very similar to the bulk push out test that we were doing, meaning that miniaturizing this testing might actually be feasible if we start testing samples which are five, six micron in thickness, which means that now we don't need to, te to test a hundred micron sample and we can accelerate all this testing. Right, so th that's that's all I wanted to show you about CMCs. I'm just checking the timing. OK. I'll try to be quick. So um, that that that's all, all the work that we have been doing in, in, in CMCs and using micro mechanics to understand how CMCs fail. But I wanted to show you a bit of the nanomechanical testing we have been doing. So something that will go somewhere up here and somewhere up here where we want to understand even at a smaller length scale what's actually going on. I don't have data on composites yet. That's going to be on zirconia material, but hopefully you get the idea of what we want to do, and hopefully that's a path to actually get more data in composites in the future. So, as I said before, we 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 use FIP to to prepare our samples, but now instead of putting our stage inside an SEM, we we use a hole that goes inside the TM. And for people that don't know how a TM works, it still works with an electron gun, but now our, our electrons are going to go in transmission. So we are using higher voltages and we need an electron transparent sample. And that's what you're going to see here. This is a double cantilever beam test, as I showed you before. <coughs> but we have an electron transparent area in the middle and that allows us to see what happens in transmission. So get a very high magnification or like high resolution image of what's happening at the nanoscale. And the data I have for that is, is just in zirconia. So this is this is really a, a, a work that has been going on in the, in the last uh, year or so. But basically zirconia is also very interesting ceramic and is also because it behaves in this pseudodactyl way. And the reason for that is because it has a phase transformation. That's this martensitic phase transformation, meaning that we have a tetragonal uh, polymorph in, in, in our zirconia, but as soon as a crack propagates, this tetragonal transforms to monoclinic. With the lucky bit that this phase transformation induces a volume expansion, and this volume expansion closes the crack. That's what you can see here at, at, at a, a at a lower Mach. But something that we were really interested in is can we actually observe this when we propagate cracks at the nanoscale and understand how the stress field ahead of the crack is actually inducing this phase transformation. Just going to give you another quick introduction on zirconia and then I'm, I'm, I, I promise I'm going to stop uh, bothering you with that. But basically the idea is that zirconia is normally uh, dope with some oxides, in general yttria or Syria, and the idea is that when you add these oxides, you can stabilize different polymorphs. 
So the monoclinic is the one that is stable at room temperature, but as soon as you start adding yttria, for example, in this case, you can stabilize the tetragonal or the cubic phase. And you can see that when we look at the y-axis and we look at the toughness of the material, this is toughness at the macro scale, we can see how the tetragonal phase has a higher toughness, right? So it's something we are really interested, right? Get, uh, understanding how this happens. So you're going to see videos of how we test 4% yttria stabilized zirconia, which is a tetragonal phase, so something that should be relatively uh, tougher. And then the cubic polymorph, which is something that is extremely brittle or relatively brittle. So that's the first example. So that's propagating cracks inside the TM. Look at the scale bar. So here we're looking at like 100 nanometer scale bar, and that's the 9% uh, yttria stabilized zirconia. So it's something very brittle. What you're going to see is how cracks appear, how the crack appear from the bottom, which is going to continue, and we can have these very controlled crack growth mechanisms, and we can see how this crack propagates to the middle of the screen. And then we can stop the test and kind of analyze what, what happened in there. And we can look at what happened at the crack tip, if there is some plasticity going on or not and stuff, right? But the most interesting thing is that when we do the same test on 4% yttria stabilized zirconia, which is the tetragonal phase, so remember that's the one that should be tougher, what we start seeing, even with a very similar scale bar, so 100 nanometers, we can see how the crack has problems to propagate. And here what you're seeing is the crack being twisted and it really gets arrested by the material. And then at some point it will want to propagate more, but you can see all this stuff going on ahead of the crack tip, which is basically arresting the crack to propagate farther. And then at some point what you're going to see is this crack tilt, uh, tilting to the side. And this basically helps us explain how the microstructure is basically changing the fracture toughness, right? And we can use some diffraction that is available on the TM to make sure that this is due to phase transformation. The advantage is also, and I wanted to write this slide, that that's kind of an important one, is that's the methodology to measure fracture toughness at the nanoscale. And how we do that is by using the to you, which is the crack opening at different values from the crack length. Yeah, so we plot what is the crack opening at different values of the crack length. So the farther we are from the crack tip, the larger these values get. But we are able to pick up the differences between two different zirconias, depending if they are the cubic or the tetragonal uh, polymorphs, and we can see that we can get some values of fracture toughness up there. And if I show you how this data, so these two values of fracture toughness, correlate to the literature, you will see how 9% yttria stabilized zirconia, that's, that's data which is done at the nanoscale, matches pretty well what is found at the macro scale. But the 4% yttria stabilized zirconia doesn't really match still what happens at the macro scale. But the reason for that is because toughness is length scale dependent. We, we know fracture toughness is not, so it doesn't matter if you test at the smaller length scale, the toughness should be very similar if you don't have any toughening going on. But in this material, because we have some toughening going on, this will be length scale dependent. So that's why we still don't get the same value that you will expect or you will measure at the macro scale. But this is interesting because this is telling us that even when propagating a crack less than a micron, we are already activating some toughening mechanisms which are arresting the crack at very early stages of crack propagation. I just wanted to show you this last video in here. So now that's the 4% yttria stabilized zirconia, the tetragonal one, the one that should be very uh, or tougher at least. And you will see how a crack comes from the bottom in here. But now by using the TM a bit more smartly, we can see all these black areas in here are the phase transformation coming up ahead of the crack tip. So here, what you can see in white, that's the, uh, th th that's the crack tip. And you can see all these black areas forming ahead of the crack tip. And uh, this, is, this is what is happening in terms of phase transformation. So we can actually can quantify what is the area of this phase transformation. <coughs> And we can see like every single frame, we can have a look at how this phase transformation has been growing ahead of the crack tip and how this actually might have an effect in toughness. I'm not going to play this video because I'm running out of time. But something that is interesting and, and how, wh why this is interesting for us is because uh, from fracture mechanics, we can uh, measure what is the stress field ahead of the crack tip. Yeah. So this, uh, here I'm plotting the bone misses stresses ahead of the crack tip, and you can see the order of magnitude bit around uh, between seven and zero G GPA. But the interesting thing is that we can overlap 
this with our phase transformation area, which is what you can see in here, and we can predict at which stresses this phase transformation is happening. Right? So here we could be reporting that something at around 2 and 4 GPA, we are triggering this phase transformation ahead of the crack tip. And now we can start comparing different zirconias and understanding how we can customize this toughening by customizing this critical stress at which phase transformation is happening. So just wanted to finish my presentation by, by, by showing you that uh, every time that we make more complex materials and that we have more complex microstructures, we are designing interfaces, and probably that's the case also of Nexcom, that you have all these nickel-like uh, interfaces going on. We're basically designing properties that uh, depend on the nanoscale. So if we actually want to understand how materials fail as a component level, I'm not saying we should stop this, doing all this mesoscale and microscale testing. I think that's really important. This is something that we, have, that we also do ourselves. But I think that's also important that we push the other length scales and we understand how every step of our processing is actually changing the properties so we can actually build a nice modeling framework, but we can also feed the development of new and better materials. Um, I didn't want to finish without acknowledgement uh, to all the people that have contributed to this work. So this is the work started uh, when I was a postdoc at Imperial and continued uh, when I was in Nottingham as a transitional system professor at the now Scarry carries on at, at Imperial with me. And there is people at Imperial and Oxford and University that have supported this work and Nottingham and also all the companies that have been funding this work and providing a sample and samples and funding. So uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to to answer them. OK, uh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Oriel, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, I'm trying to manage the lag on our live broadcast so hopefully i'm speaking at the right time to you uh, that yes, was I that was you, yeah. a really great uh, overview of lots of different techniques which might be relevant to nextcomp and with some really interesting property measurements there